about spiritual uh, intelligence. The rest will what join us if they will. And, uh, it's the ability to manifest a high mental you. capacity, a mental a state of. Can you can you all hear me? Could you please confirm, Bodia, whether you can hear me? Bodia or any other person, please could you yes. confirm if you can hear me? Loud and clear, right? Yes. 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 Okay, that's okay then. Uh, so, as you sure, So should I get lost or if I'm not audible for one reason or the other, please feel free to stop me uh, because as it is now, I can only see my screen. So I do not know who will be coming in and who will be going out, but probably I can use my phone so that I see, I control also from this end. But uh, Uh, just to begin, I uh, wish to take this opportunity first and foremost to welcome you back uh, after that short uh, break. I hope you're all keeping well and uh, observing the COVID-19 protocol. Uh, this is one of the ways that we're observing this. That's why we have to, we have to, I have to, or rather the university has to facilitate this through online learning because uh, that's what uh, the requirement dictates. Eh? So this semester, this will be a last semester, guys, and I hope uh, all is well. Uh, this semester I'll be handling uh, two units, uh, major units, of course three units, plus the SMR 400, the research project. Uh, SMR 407, which is restoration of coastal and marine ecosystems. And SMR uh, 411, which is the conservation of uh, uh, threatened marine uh, vertebrates. But for today, uh, today's session uh, will be focusing on SMR 407, which is the restoration of uh, coastal and marine ecosystem. So are we together there? Uh, as usual, if there are any communications, I prefer them. Of course, we have a platform, uh, which I and encourage people if they have challenges or, or whatever form of communication you want to reach me, you can always use that platform. If you want a private uh, uh, correspondence, I preferably like using the corporate email. So I, not unless it's a must, uh, you can use my Yahoo, but uh, I prefer whenever we are communicating, we have any correspondence, be it for this unit or any other <coughs> any other communication, please use the corporate email. So this is where the confusion was. The timetable and the units that I'll be handling. I thought, is this not what you have? The communication I have, you have on the platform, it's, it's a replica of this. Budia? The, the, one, the one you said has no time. It doesn't have time. Then uh, now that I'll be sharing these slides, now you can actually see that SMR 400, maybe it was an oversight. This is what I should have shared. Eh? Uh, because this one has time and also the, the time and the days. So as uh, you have the link there, 
and therefore for SMR 400, if it is necessary that we meet, of course, there is no point of meeting. I'll be giving a brief, probably after we are done with uh, today's uh, session on uh, SMR 407. So we'll leave that to rest because tomorrow I'll not be available. Uh, but I can do the briefing today on uh, anything concerning SMR 400. Then for 405, 407, you have the link there again, and uh, it will be every Wednesday from 2 uh, to 5. And uh, then for SMR 400, 4, 411, uh, we shall be meeting every Tuesday from uh, 9 to 12. Of course, these, these uh, timings are not casted in stone, more so because uh, this is a unique group. Uh, of course, you are not supposed to change the timetable as per the regulations, but considering uh, that uh, this is a, a group that is uh, unique in the sense that uh, you are not sharing units with other groups, should there be need to change the timing? And um, uh, we can always do that uh, through consultation. Uh, is there any question as regards the timetable? or clarification, so that we don't have uh... Swali regarding that. Science means affirmative. No. Good. OK. I'm trying to join through another gadget so that I am uh, able to see what is going on. Eh? Uh, because from the laptop, I don't have much. Uh, uh, I'm not able to navigate and see if there are people with challenges joining. I can always help them join if need be. But uh, just to begin, as I uh, so I can do, I can try to multitask. Uh, uh, I just want to give a brief course outline of what is expected of these uh, units. Uh, we'll uh, look at a number of uh, uh, items. And the first item that we shall focus on is an overview of what is ecological restoration. What is ecological restoration, the ecological restoration concept uh, in, uh, in totality? what it entails. Then uh, after that, we shall also look at uh, some of the components and approaches used in uh, ecological restoration. Then uh, item number four, uh, item number three, we shall also be looking at the guiding uh, principles that are applied in uh, any ecological restoration exercise uh, that are agreed upon. Uh, uh, they are, and therefore, they are, I can say they are standard uh, principles for any restoration exercise. Then after we understand those uh, principles, we shall look at the standards or practice or what it entails, what is uh, in terms of planning and implementation of any ecological restoration project. Then uh, we shall have an item on disturbance and, the, and impairment of uh, the ecosystems. Uh, and the reason we have this is because uh, what uh, drives a restoration is disturbance and the impairment of the ecosystems. Uh, will not have the restoration exercise in the first place if we didn't have uh, any form of disturbance or impairment. Uh, there'll be no reason actually to do the restoration. Then uh, item number six will be, will focus on the ecological attributes of uh, a restored ecosystem. Uh, we'll be looking at what should 
how should the Aristotle ecosystem look like? Or what can be used to measure whether a particular ecosystem has been restored to the level that is required or not? So we'll be looking at those uh, specific attributes as, a, as an item. Then uh, item number seven will focus on the restoration, monitoring, and adaptive management. These are terminologies that you are, of course, very familiar with. Uh, and of course, this will be focusing on after you have done the restoration, uh, you will have to, it's actually one of the requirements that uh, monitoring should be done after restoration has been uh, uh, completed. And as you monitor, uh, the other thing that goes hand in hand with monitoring is applying adaptive management. And uh, we'll look at this in depth, uh, but of course, uh, because these are terminologies that you have used and you understand what this means, uh, it's always good to uh, have some adaptive management when it comes to ecological restoration. Then we'll have some case studies. Uh, these case studies will focus on uh, overview of uh, mangrove ecosystem restoration. We can we shall also have a, a quick overview of uh, coral reef restoration and an overview of seagrass ecosystem restoration. Af and if time allows, we can also look at one of our terrestrial uh, restoration exercise, either forest or uh, not a forest, a mine site that has been impacted. Uh, how do you go about restoring such a site? So these three items basically will be based on our case studies. How where have this been done? And uh, how can this restoration be done in practice for those, for those various uh, key ecosystems? Then uh, the last item will focus on the current global initiatives. So what is the world doing on matters ecological restoration? And what are the targets? There is so much uh, uh, going on in terms of uh, restoring uh, degraded ecosystems globally. And uh, what really drives these initiatives? Uh, are there commitments? Are there targets? Uh, we'll be looking at that as an item. So probably I need to ask a, a question. Uh, looking at that overview of what is expected of these units, may I now get back from uh, get it from you? Is there what is your expectation of this unit? Is there anything that? Uh, <clears throat> Scanning through those uh, items that I have uh, highlighted, <clears throat> uh, what are the other maybe items, or what was your expectation? Is this the scope of the your expectation for this particular unit, or is it too heavy? Is it uh, too light? Can I give you five minutes? You think about this. You tell me whether we can uh, make it better, or maybe we are too. Are we too ambitious, or are we under ambitious? Are you guys still there? Yes, we are there. You are there. So, uh, now that you have mentioned you are there, Maureen, 
from the voice, I can tell that's Maureen. Maureen? Yes. So if I may ask uh, you as, as a person, what was your expectation of this unit in terms of uh, the coverage, the scope? Okay, according to me, mm, mm -hmm. I expected maybe we have a trip to a site that has been restored and see how it looks like. Okay. What else? Anything else? Is there anything else? Mbodia? Mbodia? Yes, sir. Is it, there's so much noise from my end, yeah? No, no, no. Okay. Um, I was just, I was asking, is, what's your opinion? As regards the scope, uh, you are... Uh, as for me, since we are talking about uh, restoration and um, uh, uh, coastal and marine ecosystem, from the coast outline, I can, I can see you've uh, addressed uh, everything from the ecosystems. What, uh, what are these ecosystems? And uh, as well as the case studies that uh, winds up everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is for me. All right. Anything else from any other person? Before I, before I react to what... Uh... So we can uh, hear some noise from your end. Uh, unfortunately, this uh, this the better part of this semester will be online. But I hope when we come back from the because we will be coming back because of the exams and we'll have that uh, we have a field trip either to a degraded or a restored mangrove ecosystem or a degraded or restored reef ecosystem and or uh, a seagrass ecosystem and more importantly the places that we've been taking uh, students the previous group we've uh, mostly we take them to to south coast for a mangrove ecosystem there is a lot of work going on in uh, in uh, in south coast especially in gazi where we have the mikoko pamoja uh, project that is one of the project that is uh, has been focusing on uh, ecosystem restoration and of course there are many other other ecosystems that have been restored we have uh, quite some good work on coral reef restoration that has been done in uh, in shimoni uh, we also have uh, of course a terrestrial ecosystem and uh, a classical example of a restored ecosystem of that where we have had a chance to take students is also the, the Bamburi, uh mine site that that's one area that uh, also has a has a has a, is a is a good site to also visit with students because uh, it's a classical example of where uh, degradation has taken place through mining and uh, there has been uh, restoration going on 
and the case and the same case applies also to a site in uh, Tiomins. Uh, they are a bit strict, but uh, we have not had a chance to take students there. But uh, of course, we cannot go to all these sites. We have to uh, choose one. And therefore, I'm aware that uh, if need be, uh, not really need be, of course, there is need. Uh, but uh, we will uh, pursue with the admin that uh, immediately you guys arrive, we should be able to do a visit to uh, one of these sites for this for this unit, for the benefit of this particular unit. So if that is in agreement, uh, of course, you can always mention uh, this uh, unit. It's not cast in stone. We can always... I like a, a dynamic unit where we can always uh, change things here and there so so that it suits. Now that you, you are dealing with uh, more mature students, uh, you have interacted with these ecosystems and therefore obviously you know uh, what are the limitations. And that's why sometimes you're also asked to do an assessment of this course in general so that we see where the areas that require improvements. And that's why I was asking, I was posing that question, whether the scope of what we have, uh, have, uh, have uh, shared is, uh, is what you were expecting. Is it uh, overrated or is it underrated? Uh, hopefully, you're not keeping anything to yourself. So, on a course assessment, uh, it's the same approach that I always use. Uh, but as you know, uh, this usually applies when we have a face-to-face -face engagement. But uh, we'll have our first cut, which will be online. I will decide uh, whether it's possible to do uh, an online uh, open book cut. You know what an open book cut is? Uh, where you should you can use the materials that you have, but you complete that exam within the stipulated time and make sure that you submit it within the stipulated one hour. Alternatively, we can have a sort of a, an assignment uh, cut, but uh, it will be around, the most important thing is that it will be online and it needs to be uh, submitted by 7th of July. So cut two will also be an assignment, and that again needs to be submitted by. Uh, no, I think that's that's an omission. It cannot be 9th of July. I think it's 9th of August, if I'm not wrong. Uh, but I I will communicate this before the the set date. But at least the first one, I think I'm pretty sure that uh, it has to be. 7th of July. Uh, as regards the field trip that Carol, uh, uh, Carol raised, I said that there are three options, either this, a visit to Gazibe where you be able to see the work of restoration that is going on on, on mangroves, or you go to Shimoni where you'll be able to see a uh, some restoration of the reef ecosystems and uh, or uh, Halapak, where they are doing mine site restoration. Uh, of course, the exam will be face to face and uh, that will be communicated uh, at the right time. So is there any question as regard cost assessment or clarification? Anything? So can we continue? Are you guys still there? Yes. <laughs> Buddy, I should should I should you lose me? Just uh just uh flash my phone, yeah? Okay. Yeah. So the big question is what is restoration? Yeah. Is this a new 
Is this a new terminology? Of course, this is it's not a new terminology because uh, you can continue. Yeah. Uh, I have highlighted the two terms, structure and function. Uh, and also notice that uh, we are talking about bringing back because it may not be necessarily from its original state. Original state probably would have been worse or even or better because it could be original millennial in, uh, in, in, uh, in nature or in, time, in terms of time. But uh, we want to bring it back to a functioning ecosystem in terms of and in terms of function. So what do I mean by structure and function? These are the a structure original structure we are talking about the complexity of an ecosystem in terms of the species composition and the numbers in terms of uh, if it's a marine ecosystem like a reef ecosystem how many species are there in terms of numbers if they are groupers, for example, we use, uh, for example, species like groupers as uh, an indicator species. How many are they in terms of numbers? So that's why you need monitoring of the ecosystems periodically or regularly so that you determine, for example, numbers. Again, the other thing about structure is the types of species. It's not just the numbers, but how many species are there? Is the, is the ecosystem diverse in terms of species? Or is it just uh, particular species that are there? So the more the, the more the species, the types of species, the variety of species, the more complex that ecosystem will be. And therefore, the more robust the, the, the ecosystem. Then on the other hand, in terms of function, the ecosystem should be able to function properly, both in terms of services and in terms of good, uh, in terms of goods provision. So an ecosystem, therefore, like I have just said, has two attributes that I have highlighted there. That is the structure and function. So these two attributes are usually used to define and illustrate the level of damage that uh, an ecosystem has suffered. And therefore, an original ecosystem, as it were, will have high values of those two attributes. It will have high values of those two attributes both the structure value will be very high and the function value if it is measured will also be very high and therefore when degradation takes place these two it what actually ha happens is that these two attributes structure and uh, function will go to almost and that's how a degraded ecosystem is, is, uh, is defined. And therefore, if an area, if a, an ecosystem is degraded, and that ecosystem is left on its own, the ability that that ecosystem might re start regenerating or recreating itself of the 
degradation is reduced and therefore it naturally the natural processes of uh, primary succession can actually begin if the pressure of degradation is is if it is reduced so when restoration there are other similar commonly used terms and these the other terms that have been used commonly include uh, rehabilitation remediation uh, or reclamation so my question is is there a difference between these terminologies or can they be used interchangeably meaning to, and mean the same thing do they mean the same thing So I wanted you to take some time and uh, look at these other terminologies. When you look at uh, restoration, rehabilitation, remediation, and reclamation, what is the difference between these uh, terminologies? Do they mean the same thing? Guys, are you there? Yep. Yes, we are there. So, what's I want you to take uh, 10 minutes. We come back at uh, 3 3 12, and uh, you select uh, four people to define those four terminologies, trying to differentiate them so that we know uh, are they. Do they mean the same thing? Okay. Are we together? Yes. Yes. I'm actually going to stop presenting so that uh, you just take a few minutes and uh, discuss among yourselves so that we know we, you tell me whether we can drop the other three and look and, and, and agree which terminology you should use or should we use all of them but uh, referring to different things is that is that a assignment uh, or a short uh, discussion uh, clear Yes, yes, but uh, are All there right. no breakout rooms? Uh, yeah. Sorry? The breakout rooms. I don't have, I, I think I should have set it up. Uh, I should have set it up, but now I'll take so much time to start looking at uh, how I should. Uh... You can actually see yourself online, eh? So if you decide, I want I want you to break. You are almost uh, you are approximately thirty people. So you, if you can break in five five, I'll uh, do it next time. Uh, to, I don't know how. I've never used uh, breakout rooms in the in the Google Meet, but I'll find out. I'll find out. That's a good uh, uh, suggestion. But I want each group to define those terms. Alternatively, you discuss it among all of you, but there has to be one person uh, explaining what each term means. Actually, not three, because you have already explained what restoration is. I want you to tell me whether that is different from rehabilitation or reclamation. And therefore, I need a definition for the other three. Go. Okay. Bodia, can you still see my screen? Uh, yes. And now? No.
I'm giving it up to grade 12, then I'll be back. Marine, take it off.
Good dia. Take it over, madam. Side three twelve, past three twelve. How I'm busy going. Uh... All right. Uh, it's unfortunate. I didn't know there was such a such a feature. Uh, that would have worked much better. Are you guys there? Yes. 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 Uh, let me let me get back. So, did you get a chance to talk among, among yourself? I don't know how you did it because ideally I should have broken you into groups, uh, but I didn't know that uh, there is such a, a feature on uh, Google Meet. I know it works with the Zoom, but uh, I didn't know there is such a feature. I should be able to do that uh, next time. But all the same, Nyamoita. Uh, uh, Yes, sir. Were you able to discuss among yourselves? No, because we could not. Okay. We were not into groups, so it was a challenge in discussing. So I don't think if we discussed, but everyone did, did it on its own. On our own. Everyone did it on their own. So yes. what, what, what's, your, what's your take on uh, uh, the use of those other uh, terminologies? According to me, I think the terminologies can be used replacing each other. In short, they are synonyms. So in your opinion, uh, restoration and rehabilitation is one and the same thing? Yes, restoration, rehabilitation, and remediation. Though the last one may be seemingly to be a bit different, but can also be. So you, in, you, there's no difference between restoration and rehabilitation? No, there's no difference. But with reclamation, it seems mm -hmm. a bit different. So what is the difference? What, is, uh, uh, what, what makes it uh, different from the rest? Reclamation. With reclamation, I don't think the ecosystem would have been degraded. degraded. Instead, it's mm -hmm. what 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 was a waste, mm -hmm. which is reclaimed to be useful. It's what is considered. I know what, what it's. They are reclaiming to be a waste. Is that yes. what you are? Uh, can you give us an example of anything wasteful that has can be reclaimed to something useful? An example, uh, for example, reclaiming land from the sea. Mm -hmm. So you reclaim land from the sea and make it maybe land for like they country. do, like they do in, uh, for example, maybe in Holland or in Netherlands. Yes, that one. But that, does it mean that uh, the land Yeah. Do you have any other person? Is the different? Go there. Uh, yes, sir. Is, uh, do you have a different? Are, are the three terms? Can the three terms be used interchangeably? Yeah, for me, uh, I find um, yeah, they are. They can be used uh, interchangeably, mm -hmm. mm, uh, and uh, as Ma Maureen has said, uh, reclamation. Uh, though I took it from an ownership point of view, mm -hmm. I think um, 
kuna tatizo kidogo Owino Clifford Any take on this Nothing much there <laughs> Edwin Moset Yes sir So uh, are all the great terms according to you in your lay explanation layman's explanation uh, do all the same i think they are just the same they can be used interchangeably you think so yes so is uh, for example when you look at what is uh, for example what uh, baburi semen is doing in the mind sites is that restoration is that reclamation is that rehabilitation or it's all the same it's a have, you, have you had a chance or uh, a privilege to be at bamburi nature, nature yes. or no, uh, halapak yes what, what have you noticed uh, what do they do there or what, how, what do they use to rehabilitate the 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 main uh, quarries if you go to halapak you'll notice that they are ma they mainly use one particular species which is uh, there is so much use of uh, the the pine is it yes <coughs> why do they use the why do they use the, the pine and would you and if they use the pine and uh, the way I have defined restoration restoration is trying to return a degraded ecosystem to its original state but when you look at what uh, bamburi semen is doing they just uh, may, let me use the right term they rehabilitate that uh, those uh, mine sites but they don't return those ecosystems to the original state because when you look at, for example, the, the diversity of species, the, the species that they commonly use or they mainly use is the, is the, is the, the pine, is it? And there is a reasoning behind why they use the pine. It's because it's able to, uh, to, to do well in a, in a degraded uh, ecosystem. So you, that does not qualify as restoration because restoration uh, according to the to the definition is returning to the original state meaning the function and the structure that was there before the degradation or before the mining started ought to have been returned to that so, and therefore restoration is not re rehabilitation right are you in agreement right yes that's fine. yes yes so that is not rehab that's not restoration that is rehabilitation yes so uh basically what i want to say is that uh all these four terminologies they are commonly used together but uh they actually mean different things so for example when you look at rehabilitation like i've explained with the case of uh, bamburi cement mining site so rehabilitation is the action of restoring a thing to a previous condition or status so that means so much like restoration but one thing that is uh gives it a distinction from the restoration is that there is little or no implication of perfection in terms of structure and in terms of structure and, and function so they're just returning it to a better state rather than just leaving that site as a, a quarry they just return it to that state a better state 
but it's not a perfect state. But it is at least better than leaving it there. So that is what rehabilitation is all about. And therefore, it's actually very different from restoration. So a rehabilitated ecosystem is not expected to be in original or healthy state as if it had been restored. And that's now you can actually see the distinction between a rehabilitated and a restored state. And that's why even in, uh, in life, sometimes when you abuse drugs, you are taken to a rehabilitation center, right? But really, do you actually get back to your normal faculties properly? And if you, the, your normal faculties, it will take time. And that's even when there is need for rehabilitation, there is always a possibility that you might relapse. And once you relapse, you'll go back to the state of degraded state. But if you continue to be supported, you can actually get back to the, the same faculty, faculties that you had before you engaged in uh, drug abuse. And that applies also to uh, ecosystem, to natural ecosystems. On the other hand, when you talk of remediation, even as the name suggests, you are trying to remedy. Like, so remediation may sound so much like it's also the same as restoring, but to remedy is to rectify or to make good. So the process, so remediation involves the process of removal or reduction or neutralization, for example, of contaminants from a site to prevent or minimize the adverse effect that that impact may have on the environment. And therefore that differentiates it from restoration. And a classical example here may include oil spills in a mangrove ecosystem. So the idea here is actually not to restore the mangrove by planting new mangroves, but first of all, making that ideal for possible restoration, either natural rest uh, through uh, natural process or a mediated or assisted uh, uh, restoration. So the first action that you take to reduce that impact is what we refer as the remediation. So you read a site, if a site get degraded because there was an oil spill, if you are to restore that site, you cannot restore it in that state. You will have first to remediate, you will first have to rectify that site. You will have to make it ideal for possible restoration. Otherwise, you will be restoring, but uh, it will be an activity in futility. You plant, but nothing grows. And therefore, you need to rectify the factors that are not right for uh, restoration to take off. So here, the emphasis is therefore on the process rather than the the end point. So you first rectify so that once the end point will be a site that is ready to begin uh, getting restored, either through ass assisted uh, means or by, by naturally, uh, through natural process. On the other hand, when you look at reclamation, uh, Maureen was uh, defining this as turning a, a wasteland into a useful, useful, useful ecosystem. For example, we have seen uh, various, uh, uh, like uh, I was mentioning, Netherlands have reclaimed better part of their land from the sea. But it doesn't mean that that land was wasteful. It was still useful. It was a useful ecosystem. But they are just changing the use from one use to another use. Or even when we have 
terrestrial ecosystem like wet, wetlands being drained so that they can convert that land to agricultural piece of land that they can use to, to grow crops. That does not qualify that area as a wasteland. That land was equally useful as it was. As a wetland, it had a function. It has a function, a very important function, and therefore we do not even encourage reclamation in uh, ecology. So reclamation is the process of returning land to its former or any other productive use. And I say any other productive use. Either you want to reclaim so that you have bigger land. You have had the, the Netherlands people saying that God created the world. And Hollanders created what? Netherlands. So they have reclaimed from the sea what uh, was not uh, useful according to their, uh, their, uh, their definition. So in this case, reclam reclamation has no implication of returning it to its original state, but to a useful state. So when you look at this uh, figure, these are options that are usually used for improvement of a degraded ecosystem to a, a useful ecosystem. And I say that in any ecosystem, there are two major attributes. That is the structure and the function. So when you look at the x-axis, we have the ecosystem structure. And this ecosystem structure could be in form of the number of species in that ecosystem, individual, eco in individual species, and could also be in terms of the species that are there. Then there is also another aspect of how complex is that ecosystem in terms of how healthy is it in terms of, for example, if you're talking about the forest structure. What is the height of that ecosystem, of the average trees? Or what is the diameter of the most trees in that ecosystem? So that is what constitute ecosystem structure. Then the other attribute is the ecosystem function. So this applies to what goods and services can that ecosystem provide? So when you look at this figure, you'll notice that we have a degraded ecosystem. And this degraded ecosystem is very low in terms of ecosystem structure, and it's also very low in terms of the services, in terms of the ecosystem function that is providing to the man, to the, to the ecosystem. And therefore, the idea behind restoration is to try and drive that degraded ecosystem back to the original state. And the original state, you will notice that that ecosystem will have very high level or magnitude of ecosystem structure and very high level of ecosystem function. But in the process of doing this, more often than not, it's not possible to return a degraded ecosystem back to its former state. And therefore, the best that you can do, actually, you'll notice that you can only probably try and rehabilitate that ecosystem, but it is practically often impossible to return it back to the original state. Alternatively, you can actually replace or rehabilitate it to be something different. And if you replace it with a different ecosystem, for example, like they have done at Bamburi, it may not, it, it may have very high ecosystem function, but it may not be able, you may not be able to return that ecosystem 
to provide, to have the same ecosystem structure in terms of complexity like it was originally. But it is better than allowing that ecosystem to remain in a degraded state. So in the event that you just leave a degraded ecosystem as it is, there are several possibilities that might happen. That ecosystem might degrade completely, get even worse than uh, it is, or it might stagnate in that state, or even get worse. So when you look at this figure again, it's more or less the same figure, but uh, the trajectory that is expected is the one that is in dashed uh, arrow, that in the process, there are several possibilities that might happen in case an ecosystem is degraded. If you neglect it, it will go back to, it will actually be more degraded at the end of the day or over time. Or if you neglect it, but you reduce pressure, there is a possibility that it might start following that trajectory back to the original state. But if you continue giving pressure to that ecosystem, it might get even worse than it is. Alternatively, there is a possibility that the best you can actually do is just to replace the degraded ecosystem with a better ecosystem. And that's what we are calling uh, uh, reclamation, for example, or rehabilitation. But in the process of rehabilitating, there is always, there is high possibility that that ecosystem may go back to the original state, but that will again be a function of time and also intervention. There has to be some intervention, either passive or active intervention. By active intervention, I mean it requires to be assisted to get rehabilitated. Or you can also have a passive, uh, a passive assistance, which is reducing the pressure on that ecosystem. So if the ecosystem was getting degraded because there is overfishing, for example, you don't need to reintroduce species or fish in that ecosystem. You only need to reduce the pressure of fishing. And how do you reduce pressure? You as a manager can decide that while we were using, uh, we, we were allowing probably, for example, if, if it is a marine park, we were allowing traditional methods of fishing in a, in a, in a protected area, in a reserve. You can, take a you can actually make a decision that you're, gonna, you're going to close that, uh, you're going to close that, uh, uh, marine park for let's say three months to allow it to to rehabilitate itself naturally without actually doing anything else and that's what we are calling a passive approach uh, on uh, when it comes to rehabilitation so when you look at all those you will actually notice that these terminologies are very different they are not the same for uh, they're actually very different from, from each other, but often they're used interchangeably and they can actually confuse. But uh, when you look at it from this perspective, you'll notice that it's actually very possible to explain them uh, uh, differently. Is there any question as regards the differences between those terminologies? Hey guys, are you still there? Yes, we are there. Muko, Muko, eh? Yes. Muko. All right. So again, when you look at a degraded ecosystem, again, it depends on the type of ecosystem that is degraded. Some ecosystems 
like I said, it's not easy, it's not practically possible to return a degraded ecosystem back to its original state. But again, that depends on the type of ecosystem. For example, when you compare an aquatic ecosystem vis-a-vis -a, -vis a forest ecosystem, an aquatic ecosystem is likely to regain its original state much faster as compared to a forest ecosystem, owing to a simple reason that the aquatic ecosystem is usually small in, in nature and there is high or high mobility of, uh, of species and therefore it's easier for that ecosystem to regain its original state much faster as compared, for example, to a forest ecosystem because the forest ecosystem requires a very long period. For example, if you cut a tree that has taken, for example, 500 years or even 100 years to grow, for it to go back to that state and you have chopped all the trees, it will take equally the same amount of time for it to get back to that state, to that original state. And therefore, I say that true restoration is ideally very unrealistic, and especially for some ecosystem. And therefore, rehabilitation or replacement in that ecosystem may be the best option. Because as you do rehabilitation, as you do replacement of that ecosystem, you can actually give it the ideals for it to get back to their original state, uh, no matter how long it's gonna take in terms of time. So then the other terminology that is also commonly used is ecological resilience. So when you say that you are resilient, even uh, as the uh, as, a, as a term uh, uh, suggests in, in English, when you say that someone or something is resilient, it means that uh, it can take so much pressure without changing, right? So for example, if you have two people, uh, I don't know who in class, we have uh, Joseph Nyamo, is, is Joseph Nyamo there? Yeah? Is Joseph Nyamo with us? Is Budia with us? Yes. So, what do you understand? What, 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 what do you understand by uh, resilience? Um, I refer to it as the ability to uh, bounce back, maybe um, from setbacks and such. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 very correct. So, when you say that an ecosystem is resilient. Uh, Com well, especially when you look at it from the perspective of those attributes, we have the we have uh, the two attributes in terms of function and in terms of uh, uh, structure. Uh, structure. So, an ecosystem that is resilient we have will require to have very high attributes of the two uh, high level of those two attributes. So if an ecosystem has lower attribute of one of those or both of them, then such an ecosystem will be less resilient. So an ecosystem that, that has a high number of species, for example, will be more resilient because there is high interconnectivity of species and the ecosystem with other ecosystems. And therefore such an ecosystem will be considered to be very resilient in nature. 
And therefore, as you have put it rightly, uh, resilience refers to the ability of an ecosystem to return to its original state after it has been disturbed. So, or rather, how fast the variables in the, an ecosystem return to equilibrium after disturbance. So, and therefore, an ecological res re resilience is the amount of disturbance that an ecosystem can absorb before it is changed to another state. And that's why I was looking for Nyamu, because Nyamu looks like he's one of the strongest men we have in class. So when you compare Nyamu with probably one of our girls in the class, if they were to be subjected to some pressure, maybe a kick or a slap, one of them will actually fall down and maybe not be able to, to stand, right? But maybe Nyamu will be able to resist that. Uh, and that's what we are referring as resistance from that disturbance. He will be more resistant to disturbance as compared to a person who has less weight, uh, if you were to use weight as one of the attributes. So resilience is the ability of an ecosystem to recover from disturbance. So ideally, an ecosystem shows resistance by reacting little to increase in pressure. So if you subject an ecosystem to some pressure, for example, overfishing or uh, logging or whatever pressure you subject an ecosystem to. So the structure and complexity of the food web on the, that ecosystem, uh, which we refer as the connect or connectance or connectivity of that ecosystem, will be, will, be, will, be, will be compromised. Or rather, if the connectance is very high, then such an ecosystem will have very high resilience or ecological resilience and therefore in short i want to say that highly connected ecosystems are more resilient or if you will they are more robust to species laws than less connected ecosystem and therefore if we have mangrove ecosystem and uh, we looked at, when you look when you look at the connectivity of ecosystems such as mangrove, uh, seagrass, and the and the and the reef ecosystem, uh, systems that are interconnected in that nature are more robust. They are more resilient than a, an ecosystem that is not connected to some of these ecosystems. So that if there is, for example, pressure emanating, let's say from uh, stormwater with high sedimentation. If that ecosystem is connected to mangroves, then that ecosystem in totality will be more robust, will be more resilient as compared to an ecosystem that is not connected to other ecosystems such as, for example, if such an ecosystem was subjected to the same impact or to the same pressure of sedimentation, the chances are that Seagrass ecosystem will die very fast, as well as the reef ecosystem, if it was not connected to the mangrove ecosystem. Because the mangrove ecosystem will act as the first uh, uh, defense in reducing the level of sedimentation. And therefore, that will have less impact on uh, seagrass as well as the reef ecosystem. And uh, therefore, what we have here is a conceptual model of an ecosystem vis-a-vis uh, -vis the pressure. So we have two types of resilience. We have what we call complete resilience and incomplete resilience. So complete resilience is a situation where an ecosystem 
can go back to its original state after disturbance. While incomplete resilience is where an ecosystem is subjected to some pressure, but it can resist, it can resist that pressure, but it may not go back. It may not have the ability to, to go back to the original state. So such an ecosystem is considered to have less pressure. So often systems that have very have complete resilience also have the ability to resist change over long period or no, long period and over extended uh, pressure. For example, high level of sedimentation or pollution. It can rest, it can resist that over a long period. So complete resilience therefore refers to returning to the original state after disturbance. While partial resilience or if you will, incomplete resilience is resilience or is a, is a, a returning of an, of an ecosystem to slightly lower level. Uh, of its original state. So in this uh, model, the, you can see the area, the, 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 the area marked in A is what we are referring as complete an ecosystem system that depicts a complete resilience while B uh, refer, shows an ecosystem that has partial uh, resilience. And all this is related to structure and complexity of an ecosystem as well as the, the uh, structure and composition, uh, structure and, uh, and, uh, and function. Is there any question up to there? Yep. So the other question I wanted to ask you, why do we bother with uh, ecosystem restoration? Why do people, why, why do we get uh, attracted? Uh, or rather, have we in life participated in any restoration exercise? Have you guys participated in any restoration? Clifford. Not really, but uh, I can tell a, a single reason why we restore ecosystem. You have never participated in any restoration? You've never planted a tree? I have planted, that is back at home. Back at home. <laughs> so you still participated in uh, restoration, didn't you? Or oh, that was not restoration. Where were you planting trees? In Kisumu. I mean, where? In uh, what kind of an ecosystem? I just a general ecosystem. Yeah. Around home. Around around your compound. Yeah. So why why were you doing that? Maybe that's why we should begin there. Why? Why did you? Why did you plant those trees around your compound? I had a target that I will use them for building some three years to come. So the the reason was actually economic. Economic reason, and then in addition to that, mm -hmm. uh, the beauty of the environment. You want yes. to make it? You wanted to make your compound looks beautiful. Uh, yeah, look nice, attract people. Yeah. And then some pressure. Uh, all right, those are those are those are good reasons actually to participate in restoration. Meaning, most of us have actually engaged in restoration of of, of some sort, right? The reasons for doing this are very diverse. Like uh, uh, Clifford put it, he purposely was doing this so that 
in a few years time he will be able to harvest timber and probably put up his simba and maybe the other reason is to make the place looks beautiful because uh, when you have a green around your compound the place uh, looks uh, of course uh, beautiful but the other question is are there other reasons why we do restoration to continue yeah. obtaining the ecosystem services like cycling mm -hmm. nutrient cycling uh, the cleaning of the air as well as water retention yeah so meaning there you can actually uh, combine that and maybe call them they could be what uh, it could be ecosystem services, uh, restoration of ecosystem services or ecological services, right? So those are the reasons, right? Is there any other reason why we do restoration? Yeah. To yes. Have Have you guys have, have any of you participated in uh, mangrove uh, restoration or terrestrial forest uh, restoration tree planting or any other form of restoration? Yes. So, what have you participated in? Is that what they're saying? Yes. 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 So, what was it that you were doing? We were planting mangroves in uh, uh, Mikindani. Mikindani. Yes. So, what really, what really motivated you to actually even engage in that? Uh, so, um, a. Uh, to, to be frank, I was uh, I was invited, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, it's still uh, an area since I'm doing a nature-related course. Mm -hmm. Yes. And maybe they told you you might you might get paid two hundred bucks for participating, or you'll get a free T-shirt, or you'll. Uh, uh, oh, get some water. Is that also a motivation? Oh, looking looking at it, they were they were doing it to help the communities since they mm -hmm. were uh, they do the community does uh, beekeeping and so they, they are doing it to help the communities uh, as well as uh, the obvious like um, protection from hazards and, and all that. Mm. So basically, I don't know whether there are other reasons, but uh, in the recent past, ecological restoration has become a, one of the buzzwords, a feel-good word. It's uh, something that uh, majority wants to be associated with. You have even seen, uh, uh, currently, I think uh, you can see a lot of institutions engaging in restoration exercises. Haven't you seen that as part of uh, corporate social responsibility, maybe? You have seen KPA doing that. You have seen other institutions like even banks participating in, in, uh, in uh, tree planting exercises, true? Or some institution even offering money, like uh, you have seen uh, you have uh, in the recent past uh, uh, as Equity Bank was celebrating, uh, was it that, how many years? I think that year since, or 30 or 25 years since they, they began uh, the operation and they have dedicated 25 
million Kenya shillings to be used for tree planting, etc., to restore degraded sites or to be used in tree planting, right? So you can actually see that uh, it's not just institutions that uh, are relevant to, 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 to environment that are participating in this exercise, but we, there are so many people and so many institutions that are doing ecological uh, restoration. But there are a variety of uh, reasons why you engage in uh, ecological restoration. So I don't want to subject you to this because uh, I wish I could have done this through the breakout uh, rooms. But uh, I just wanted us to reflect on, that's why I'm posing these questions. Why do we engage in ecological restoration? And uh, a few of you have actually shared some of the reasons why they have participated in uh, these exercises. And the reasons are diverse. The same case applies to even those institutions I was just mentioning, Equity Bank, Safaricom, uh, Kenya Ports Authority, uh, KFS, KWS. They all have different reasons why they are doing this, right? And all those reasons are valid. They all have a place when it comes to ecological restoration. There is, they have diverse, sometimes you, even when you when you restore, it sometimes it just feels good to have participated. If I, for example, if I ask Bodhya, you must have felt like a hero for having been involved in such an exercise, and uh, you participated. You've uh, made yourself dirty, but in the evening when you are reflecting, you can actually you can count that. I've done so many trees, and maybe it could be a target for you. You individually, as students, you may say that for the period that I'll have stayed at the course for those two years during my uh, bachelor studies, maybe you could have set a target that I should have planted uh, 100 trees or 200 trees or whatever number the target you may wish to give yourself. And uh, the reasons for doing that, they could be so diverse. Some of them will just be, you just want to feel good that you contributed to uh, the betterment of, uh, of, 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 of the environment. So as we think about uh, those reasons, uh, you have heard of the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. So ecosystem, UN decade on ecosystem restoration uh, begins this year, 2021, all the way to 2030, because 2030, that's when we ought to have achieved most of the SDGs. And, for, and that's why they have actually dedicated this UN decade on ecosystem restoration. We only have one decade for us to have achieved the set out uh, uh, targets. And this also applies to other commitments. When you look at the CBD commitment, did we achieve what we were planning to achieve? Because the targets were supposed to have been achieved by the year 2020. Did we achieve that? If we did not achieve, they are dedicating this decade so that you can restore all the degraded sites. May, for example, one of the targets of the CBD, Convention on Biodiversity, uh, uh, Biological Diversity, was to half the areas that are degraded. By halving the area that are degraded, I mean, if you had a thousand hectares in Kenya that are degraded, uh, in terms of mangroves, the target 
other party and a signatory to, C to CBD was to ensure that at least 500 hectares have been restored. And if it has not been restored, this is the time to actually actualize that between 2021 and 2020. So the aim of this uh, decade is to prevent and halt the re or rather reverse the degradation of the ecosystem on every continent, particularly for countries that are a party to the Paris Agreement and the uh, uh, CBD and many other conventions that uh, we have committed to in uh, uh, promoting uh, restoration of degraded ecosystems. So the target for ecosystem restoration as per the UN decade on, uh, on uh, ecosystem restoration is to ensure that for every dollar spent in restoring the ecosystem, there has to be good returns. That should be in the range of $3. For every dollar we spend, the return should be between $3 to $75 in terms of the economic benefits uh, in form of ecosystem goods and services by the year 2030. So even as we celebrate the UN decade on ecosystem services, we are actually supposed also to be celebrating the World Environment Day. So the World Environment Day is actually on uh, 5th of June, which is which will be on, is it on Saturday or Sunday? Saturday, right? So and uh, this is a day that is usually commemorated every year. Every that 5th of June, we celebrate or we commemorate uh, the World Environment Day. But the theme uh, for this year has been uh, synchronized with the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. And therefore, the theme will be on ecosystem restoration. And therefore, this is usually done by uh, uh, celebrated through uh, the FOCO institution, uh, which is NEMA, and uh, they actually choose where to celebrate uh, such a day. And uh, therefore, this year they will be doing this in Garissa uh, University grounds. That's where uh, the national uh, event will take place. But that does not mean that. The only place that will get rehabilitated or restored is uh, Garissa. So in uh, small ways, this can also be done, even at KU level or any other uh, institution. I've seen some, some of the former students from your group, they have, uh, they have already sent some, some, some uh, flyers that uh, they'll also be doing some restoration, I think, at Tudor. Uh, is it Tudor Creek or something like that? Have some of you seen these uh, flyers? Yes. So uh, I will encourage those who can uh, uh, partake in this or wherever you are, I don't know where most of you are, Some for those who are not in Mombasa, you can still participate in a small way uh, in uh, uh, commemoration of this important important day. So the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration will be launched officially on 5th so that it is synchronized together with the World Environment Day. Although uh, UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration has already begun, but uh, there will be, of course, be launching it officially so that it coincides with the World Environment Day. So the reason we do restoration, as uh, some of you have already mentioned, is to improve the ecosystem services, be it cycling, be it uh, the, the, the catches that we get from uh, those ecosystems. 
The other reason could be just to promote environmental education. The reason we have such a, 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 an environment day is to sensitize the masses and the public about the importance of the environment. So they participate in the restoration and in the process, they also sensitize and create awareness about the importance of having a healthy ecosystem. The other reason could be recreation opportunities. Uh, you want to make a place look much better, um, more beautiful, and uh, that in itself is uh, good enough, as uh, Oino was putting it. You want to have a shade, you want to have a, a good umbrella tree around the compound. That's in itself is uh, good enough. Or even enhance the aesthetic, uh, aesthetic of the natural area. The place will just look beautiful. Uh, when you look at, uh, for example, uh, for the purposes of recreational uh, purposes, the reason they do this, when you look at the Halapak, for example, they have actually rehabilitated that. Uh, uh, degraded mine sites, and they have converted such sites again to uh, ecotourism uh, for recreational purposes. And therefore, it's actually possible to make money out of uh, those uh, activities. Uh, some of the other reasons have, that have been uh, uh, highlighted include recovering uh, sacred sites such as the Kaya, Kaya, Kaya forests. Uh, you rehabilitate because you have a high regard for these kind of uh, sites that are considered to be uh, 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 sacred. And uh, of course, uh, lastly but not least, is also to help redeem the interconnectedness of ecosystems. So when you restore one degraded ecosystem, you're actually enhancing and making the ecosystem, the interconnected ecosystem more robust or more resilient. And therefore, those, are, those reasons are not exhaustive uh, of the reasons why we do restoration. But uh, some values, some of the values that uh, make us restore are fulfilled directly by the performance of ecological restoration. For example, uh, during the World Environment Day, there will be speeches. And uh, some of the things that will be fulfilled is the environmental education awareness. So that is one of the reasons why we, we restore. And that is actually achieved on the material day. However, some of the other reasons could be long-term uh, reasons. So most values are satisfied much later uh, by a system after they have been restored. You don't expect that uh, ecosystem services will be uh felt immediately after after you have just restored it takes time for ecosystem to start uh, functioning again like it was functioning before it got de degraded and therefore when you look at all these reasons that i have highlighted they can actually be categorized as personal values, ecological values, or cultural values, or socioeconomic uh, uh, values. Similarly, when you look at this quadrant, that uh, it's a model that was actually uh, presented by uh, uh, a, a, a scientist called Ken Wilbur, in 2001, 
So from this uh, quadrant, he divided the reasons as to why we do restoration into four equal quadrants. So as viewed from the left, moving to the right. Uh, just a second. Sorry for that. <laughs> So as he, I just want to, 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 to explain this uh, uh, quadrant, and uh, maybe we'll stop it at that after this. So as viewed from uh, right, to the, from left to the right, the model consists of two hemispheres. So one is pertaining to the subjective, subjective values, and the other is, uh, concerns the objective values. So the reason we actually restore, some of the reasons are very subjective. Very, they're just emotional reasons. We just want to feel good that you have participated in, in, a, in, a, in an exercise that was engaging probably a local community. Or some of the reasons could also be very objective. You want to restore the ecosystem values or you want to improve the socioeconomic uh, livelihood of the local community because the fishery catches have gone down and you want to improve it. So the objective values can be measured and analyzed. Whereas when you say, talk of subjective values, you only, the, you're only expressing the opinions or emotional responses as to why you'd want to restore a degraded ecosystem. Again, when you look at it from again, uh, from top, you have the individual reasons and you also have the collective reasons. So as viewed from top to, to bottom, the model consists of, an, of a hemisphere that is relevant to individuals. The reasons you want to restore could be, a degraded ecosystem could be very personal, or it could also be very collective. If it is touching on socioeconomic values, or if it is touching on cultural, cultural values. So the upper quadrant represent emotion, reaction to ecological impairment. So the latter may occur that our culture would allow probably the impairment to happen or impairment may insult our aesthetic uh, sensitivity. So all these responses provide satisfaction of knowing that we did something proactive to resolve a problem that concerns all of us, which is ecological restoration. So when you look at all these uh, four uh, hemisphere, uh, and the reason that uh, Clifford gave us, or the reasons that uh, Mbodhia was giving us, the reason that uh, uh, Maureen was giving us, they can, they all fall under one of these uh, four uh, uh, quadrants. The reason they, were, they are restoring could be very, very personal, or it could be very, it could be ecological reasons, or the reason sometimes we do this is to give a service uh, to improve the socioeconomic reasons. So for example, when you look at the lower quadrant on socioeconomic values, it represents the collective socioeconomic values in regard to ecosystem services that we have curtailed or lost from uh, impairing the ecosystem or degrading the ecosystem. 
And therefore, by degrading ecosystem, by degrading an ecosystem, we place ourselves collectively as a, as a society at a greater risk of, for example, flooding. If we cut all the trees and there is, for example, a tsunami, we cut all the mangroves and a tsunami comes, it will hit the entire society. And therefore we are, we are, will actually be at the risk of flooding, for example, or if we allow degradation to take place, to take place in a, a given ecosystem by probably by overfishing, for example, it's the collective responsibility. It's all of us who will suffer because in the event, for example, there is a, fewer catches, all of us will suffer in the sense that there'll be less fish for us all. And therefore it's only those that, that will have enough resources, that will have money, that will afford the, lit, the, the small catch that will uh, be, be available. And therefore it will be very competitive. But when an ecosystem is functioning properly and the fish catches are high, it means that uh, it, it will affect all of us in a good way because we can all afford to have uh, protein or fish uh, in our table. So, and the same case applies to uh, if we degraded uh, a mangrove ecosystem, for example, we'll all be affected by flooding in the event that uh, maybe there is uh, flooding as a result of a tsunami. People who are protected, uh, if, we, if we have a healthy mangrove ecosystem, we'll all be protected. If we don't have a healthy mangrove ecosystem, few people will have uh, contributed to the degradation. But when it comes now to the damage, we all have to suffer the effect of that damage. So in other words, we have, a col we have collectively suffered. It means that we have collectively suffered in our socioeconomic values on account of ecosystem impairment. And therefore that reduces our standard of living and the well-being of the society at large. And therefore ecological restoration will allow us to recover these socioeconomic values in terms of increased ecosystem services. And therefore these services promote a stronger economy. If we have enough catches, that will promote a stronger economy. It will reduce the economic distress to those who are engaged in uh, fishing. And it will also increase the capacity of the social integration. There will be less of uh, too much conflict within the society if the, if the ecosystem is providing for all of us. Are we still together? So do you, I hope you are able to see the connection between all this quadrat as presented uh, here and uh, as I'm explaining it in terms of uh, collective vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, individual uh, re responsibilities or reasons or subjective vis-a-vis -vis objective reasons as to why we should uh, uh, promote restoration. Are you feeling exhausted? You feeling fatigued? Yeah. 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 You can we continue or we rest it fast at that? We can leave it at that. Yeah. 
So if you will, you can look at this uh, model. Uh, I think it's uh, accessible if you look, if you just type uh, Ken Walba uh, uh, quadrat model on ecological restoration. I think you should be able to access this and uh, uh, you, you can actually read better and understand what this model uh, is all about. But this one basically summarizes uh, generally the reasons as to why we participate or we do restoration of any, any ecosystem, irrespective of whether it's terrestrial or, or marine. Uh, the reasons we do all that, it's because of those four uh, categories of reasons. And again, when you look at those four categories, they can be broken again further. Are the reasons subjective or objective in nature? Or are they collective or they are individual in nature? So probably the last question I may want to ask, uh, who do you think are the best agent of uh, change when it comes to ecological restoration? Can you, guys, as students, can you, can you, can you, would you uh, consider yourself to be good about uh, ambassadors of change on matters ecological restoration? Mm -hmm. Or if I could put it differently, uh, the best agent of change, uh, or rather kids or children are considered as the best agent of change on matters ecological restoration. So why do you think how, why do you think that is the case? Or rather, if you can also put it different, if you want to succeed in ecological restoration, there is actually need uh, to engage the young generation. Do you think that is valid? Yes. Yes. So, what are what are some of the reasons to qualify this? Maureen, you're saying a very big yes. Uh, what, 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 what makes a young generation uh, the best uh, agents of change or the best ambassadors on uh, matters ecological restoration? According to me, this young generation is the ones who will, who will be remaining with that that environment. So engaging in generation will help will help the environment to be restored so that it can better for them and also for the future generation. So can you repeat that again? The young generations are the mm -hmm. owners of this ecosystems. Mm -hmm. So engaging them will enable transfer that knowledge of ecosystem restoration from the current generation to the future generation. Yeah, because young generation 
are very easy to influence in a positively, either positively or negatively. Because they, the way they look at things, if you want to culture a society, if you want to culture a society, you have you need to actually focus so much on the young generation because they will grow they are not really they actually there is even a saying i think uh, yeah, an african saying that if you want to straighten a tree you need to do it while it is still very young right once it is grown uh the perception of people when they are already grown is very conservative they become very difficult to perceive things in a different way away from how they have believed in generations or in many years but once you culture a young person it becomes part of the culture and that's why i think i keep giving you examples that uh, the reasons we have uh, uh western countries have outsmarted us in terms of uh for example uh uh garbage collection it's because they have been that's how they have been cultured from their young young age but when we start for example burning plastic bags when people are already so cultured into using plastic bags everywhere they go it becomes very difficult to instill that discipline. But if we continue, if we could do that among the young people, in future generation, the future generation, it will be an, a norm among the generation that things are supposed to be done in a particular way. And therefore, for us to succeed, especially in ecological restoration, there is need to embark and use institutions, especially learning institutions, beginning with actually the lower level of institutions, where we engage the young kids in trip planning, even if it is just trip planning within their compounds, in the schools. And uh, the reason they would want to do that is because they would want to be associated with those trees. If you give each kid a tree, to grow, to plant, by the time they are leaving that school, maybe after, let's say, eight to 10 years, that year, and each tree, each kid is supposed to take care of a number of trees, then there is a very high likelihood that you're going to succeed as compared to uh, where, uh, where you have uh, institutions uh engaging in restoration and there is very high turnover of people who have been engaged in tree planting for example that culture will not be so much instilled as compared to when you do it among the young kids so i want to leave it at that uh, but uh, as a reading assignment I'd like you to go check whether you can uh, come across this. But uh, I think at the beginning when we when I was sharing the, the course outline, I did not, uh, I think, highlight the key reading uh, references. Of course, it's not limited to any. But uh, as we move along, I'll uh, make sure that I try to share some of the <coughs> uh, some of the key uh, reference materials that I feel uh, are relevant. But uh, of course, you are not limited to that now that uh, you are mature students and you, you are known, now you're already doing research and therefore it's possible to, you're able to come across or get most of the relevant uh, materials, basing it on the scope of this uh, of, of this unit so uh, just to highlight then we'll leave it there uh, when it comes to restoration 
any degraded ecosystem, any degraded ecosystem is restrained by a number of uh, uh, components. So, and therefore the question is, what restrains an ecosystem from bouncing back uh, to the original state? So, any degraded ecosystem depends on the level of degradation. So if the level of degradation is very high, then there are various components that will need to be acted upon so that that particular ecosystem can go back to where it was. And uh, usually there are three major elements that needs to be worked on. And uh, we'll look at that next week. So the first one, you need to do what you call remodeling of the physical aspects of the habitat. Number two, you will have to remodel the chemical aspect of the habitat, such as nutrients or toxicity. You'll, in terms of, you'll have, for example, need to remediate an ecosystem before it bounces, before you, you can actually uh, engage it in the restoration. And uh, of course, the last uh, element that needs to be remodeled is the modeling of the missing species by introducing new, uh, the, the, the species that have been lost, whether they are uh, animal species or plant species. So let me just leave it at that uh, so that I just wanted to highlight it that way so that you reflect on those three uh, elements that uh, you need to focus on when you are thinking about restoring a degraded ecosystem. So a degraded, uh, restoring, restoring a degraded ecosystem will depend so much on the level of degradation. And therefore the level of degradation will dictate which elements should be worked on first. So if the system is not so degraded, probably the only thing you need to do is to replace the missing species by not planting, by probably just reducing the pressure on that ecosystem and the ecosystem will uh, automatically start regenerating itself naturally. So is there any question up to there? So allow me to take one minute or a few minutes just to talk about uh, SMR 400. Uh, So, uh, like, like I mentioned at the beginning, on the timetable, we're supposed to be meeting. We're supposed to be, it has been, or rather, uh, the, the timetable shows that uh, we should be having some engagement on SMR 400 every Thursday. Uh, but uh, that is on a, a needs basis because this is a project, uh, you have all presented your, your proposals and therefore next week what I will do, I will give you the timelines. So what you're supposed to be engaging on now, now that uh, you already presented your proposal and uh, seem to be okay with uh, all of them, uh, I want you, if you, for those who have not begun, you start collecting your data and uh, start your write-ups. So what I will uh, need to do, uh, I'd like to give you the timelines for different activities uh, because there are a number of things that you will need to do. One, you'll need to collect that data. You will need to synthesize it. 
and uh, synthesizing it is uh, basically understanding that data. Because before you analyze that data, you need to have understood it so that you know what aspects you need to uh, analyze. Then after you have analyzed, you need to describe those uh, results. And therefore, the only additional uh, components or sections that I expect from uh, uh, from uh, from uh, uh, this uh, work vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the proposal is that now you will have to add the results and discussion and recommendation. But uh, the most important thing is that first of all participate find time and that, that's the reason i was insisting that uh, you should be in mombasa if you did not have the privilege of having collected data before you left so make sure that you are able to uh, collect your data and uh, the reasons as to why you will notice that uh, we are we, we, we i always make sure uh, when I'm when I'm facilitating SMR 400 to make sure that you do not have units, a lot of workload on that from Thursday and Friday, so that you can utilize that time. That's why you have the unit on Thursday, and uh, considering that we'll not be meeting, uh, there will be no need to keep meeting. You utilize that time to begin writing and sharing, and also discussing uh, if you have any challenge uh, on, uh, on uh, analysis or any question that you need to ask, uh, I will encourage that you keep engaging with me and more importantly, keep engaging with your uh, respective members. Uh, but if there is any uh, further clarification that you need, you can actually get it from me. But I'll give up a, a proper uh, 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 clarification uh, next week uh, if there is a need. Is there any question as regards that also? Yes, Motuko. Motuko, I've seen you raising your hand. Or oh, oh, you didn't mean yes, to. Yes, sir. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Now I sent my proposal and my concept note yesterday, but I have not yet gotten your feedback. You just sent it yesterday. You think I'm just there waiting for it? Uh, <clears throat> we send it to. Did, uh, have you shared that? Have you have you uh, shared that with your with Maureen, with your mentor? Yes, I have. The comments. Uh, you have what you. Uh, Implemented the comments that she gave. I've not yet gotten any comments. You have to pursue her. Okay. But I look at it uh, if you've ready. I have not seen it. You okay. send it to which email? I keep saying you must send it to my corporate email. And if you do not know my corporate email, you check it on the on the. I send it on your corporate email. Yesterday. Yes. I don't. I, I don't. Have you have to check that email whether it is correct. Okay. Yeah, because I don't have it. I have opened my email. Like it's not there. Okay, let me check. Yeah. Uh, any other question, please? Uh, if if there's no any other question, I can leave it at that. We meet next week. Yes, I have a question. Who is that, Diana? Yes. Okay. I don't know if you had communicated about this, but just for my clarification, mm -hmm. I would love to know when are we supposed to register for the attachment for SMR 312? You only register for the attachment after you have done it, ideally. Because usually in an ideal uh, situation, you go for attachment after your third year right yes so after you are done with your third year you go for attachment then you when you come for the fourth year first semester that's when you register for that unit 
but you can actually sort for clarification from the but uh, of course you cannot be in session now and also be on attachment right yeah. you'll only be able to go for attachment after you're done with this semester so very likely from september december i think that's when you'll go for the attachment unfortunately because of the uh, this pandemic otherwise uh, you ought to have gone before you began your fourth year okay okay yeah so you don't register for it now or i do not know maybe maybe i can seek guidance from our chair uh so that but if you register for it now you'll need marks at the end of the semester which will be challenging right yeah so you'll have to wait at least but but uh, you don't need to you see ideally you'll need to have to to register for it at, after you are done with the attachment but you can actually do the attachment and register for it at the same time so that immediately after you are done with the attachment we'll do the assessment and we'll be able to post your 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 marks by december i think that's the earliest that uh, it can be done okay Is, thank you. yeah so there are there are possibility of us graduating on december I, that one i do not know the only thing i know is that you have an a win an opportunity to go for your attachment between september and december whether you'll graduate that's not for me and then a single request sorry uh, i had a single request can we be having these classes on a single day can we do what be having these classes on a single day if it's on tuesday it's a bit easy and then we do that so that we'll be having time from wednesday uh, but you have you have my class only yesterday and today I'm just trying to request you so that you put them on a single day. But uh, you have another class today. That's why I could have put it. But uh, you, Caroline, keeps changing. So I want to fix mine so that they are fixed on those two days. Sawa. Eh? So they are only two units. So I thought maybe we decide on if Tuesday you do them that single day. Can we have? Can let it remain like that until the semester stabilizes. We'll see whether, uh, because I know unit, Caroline's units are scheduled Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday, right? We talk, not unless, we not talk, unless she has changed. We talked with her and we, she agreed that she will arrange the, the classes on a single day. That's her, but uh, I don't know how you'll do it. It's okay for me. I think we can do it. Uh, we'll see, but at least uh, next week we stick it. We stick to the schedule, like uh, the way I've shared it. If need be, let's have that discussion next week on Tuesday. Sawa. Sawa. Okay. If there, if there are no any other concern. Uh, wish you a good evening. Malingine, Budia, any other person? Michael? So I've given you a green light, proceed with your 